Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining today to talk about Next.js 12.3 and some new updates that we've been working on to make Next.js the best experience for building your React applications. Uh, for those of you tuning in who maybe don't know as much about Next.js or Vercel, I'll give a quick intro. Next.js is a full stack framework for building React applications on the web. And we try to make a great developer experience that helps enable developers to create a great experience for their end users. And the creators of Next.js are Vercel, where I work, which is a company that helps developers create amazing experiences on the web. And uh, at Vercel, I'm the VP of developer experience, really helping grow and educate our community of developers. So I'm really excited today to talk through some of these features, be here to uh, answer any questions you have and just you know pull up some code, do a little demo and, and start talking about why this release is going to help you uh, improve your workflow building React applications. So yeah, feel free to continue <laughs> dropping in the chat where you're, where you're uh, tuning in from Canada, Venezuela. Thank you so much for joining today. I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can kick things off. Um, you know, please let me know if you can't see this, but I will assume that you can. Um, so Next.js 12.3, woo, it was about a week ago we released this and it was a big quality of life improvement for developers building React applications. There's a couple of things I wanna to touch on today, some small and some larger, and they all amount to really creating this better developer experience for building your React and Next.js applications. So first things first, um, we have been listening to developers feedback about how they iterate locally and make changes. And a really big pain point that we heard from multiple developers was you're editing your local files and you make changes and they don't update. And we've gotten so used to this hot reloading for all of our files, whether that's making changes in my backend code, making changes in my APIs, making changes in my front end, that we've kind of just come to expect it for <laughs> the entirety of our application, whether that's environment variable files or our configuration files for JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, so we have made this a whole lot easier. And I think what would be easiest for, for me is I'll actually go through a bunch of these and kind of show you a demo of how some of them work. Um, we'll talk about fast refresh and TypeScript improvements, image components. And then towards the end, we'll also talk about uh, some improvements to the new router and layout system coming to Next.js. But first, before we do any of that, before we get into the weeds here, I wanna kick things off with a fun announcement, which is that Next.js Conf, our third annual Next.js Conf event is happening on October 26th. It's the sixth anniversary of Next.js. And we're gonna be releasing a lot of cool features and announcements for y'all. So if you go over to nextjs.org slash conf, um, you can go and, and get your ticket here. And if you go and actually explore on the page, um, it, looks like, <laughs> it looks like somebody is here right now. Uh, it's a, a multiplayer, multiplayer game here, but basically you, you work together to figure out how you unlock the, the, uh, the golden coin. So for example, see, I can kind of move this around and it's not, it's not there, but maybe I kind of already, oh, there we go. Hey, there we go. This person knows what they're doing. It was down here somewhere, I think. Over here, no, 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 over here. Well, anyways, you click, <laughs> you click on that coin and it unlocks, well, your, it unlocks your ticket, which is pretty cool. And then it also unlocks the Wordle, if you want to go check it out and, and do your Wordle. It's basically, uh, for those of you who haven't tried Wordle before, it's a, it's a word game, five letter words, like React, for example. Hit enter, it tells you, okay, three, two of these letters were right. Sorry, spoilers, I guess, for people doing the, the Wordle today. Um, and it shows you which letters are right or which letters are not right. So there's no T, U, R, V, or O, but there is a C and an A. And the C and the A are in the correct position, but the E is not in the correct position. So give this a, a chance. We'll, we'll be having new wordles, uh, vertles every day up until the event. 
and you can win some cool stuff if you do the, the Vertles. But get your ticket and uh, join the event on October 25th. There's some other uh, different types of tickets here as well too that are kind of cool. So that is, that's the conf. Um, we'd love to see you there. I'm very excited about that. But let's, let's start talking about 12.3. I'm gonna do a couple quick demos, a fast refresh type script, and then we'll talk about the image component. So let me just uh, move this over to the right half of the screen here. Um, also just a, a quick um, housekeeping thing. Um, throughout the, the talk today, feel free to ask questions in the chat uh, and use the, the built-in Q&A functionality of, of Zoom. And I can go through here and, and try to answer them as, as we go or, or towards the end. Um, so first things first, let's start with TypeScript. So imagine you have a code base like this on the left, which this is basically, I just did create next app, um, which is MPX create next app. Um, also pro tip, you can do at latest if you wanna download the latest version of that every time. But I did this to just clone and set up a brand new code base on my machine. And this is a JavaScript code base. So let's say that I'm running my application locally. In this instance, I'm, I'm using PMPM. I've got my local dev server running and I've got this index route here and it's, it's using JavaScript. But what if I decide, you know what? I'm ready to go into the TypeScript world. I'm ready to check this out. If I press enter, you know, rename my file, I change this to .tsx, Next.js will automatically detect TypeScript. It will automatically create my tsconfig JSON file with all the right settings, as well as going into my package JSON and installing the correct dependencies for me, both the types for Node and React, as well as the actual TypeScript dependency itself. It's actually so simple that that's really the whole demo. <laughs> like there's, there's not much more than that, but it's such a nice quality of life improvement for people who are really wanting to get started with TypeScript quickly that we just make it really easy to, you know, rename your files and, and get set up on TypeScript. And you see, you know, I make changes and I get fast refresh when I edit those things. Um, so transitioning now, I have a TS config file. I'm using this to uh, configure my TypeScript settings for my application. If I make changes here, you'll notice that my dev server automatically hot reloads. So for example, maybe I wanted to add, um, you know, some, some new option here into the include array and I save, you know, that's going to be automatically picked up by the Next.js dev server. Previously, I would have had to go in here, you know, control C, uh, close or kill my local dev server, and then restart it again to pick up those changes. So it's, it's less commands that you have to type saves you more, more time. I do see a question here. Why PMPM and not yarn? Um, the reason I like PMPM, what well, I can actually demo this really quick is if I delete node modules, um, I'll just use uh, command B to close my sidebar here. And I do, uh, I have an alias, by the way, PN is PMPM, just because I always fat finger that. So PMI, what you'll notice is that it's really fast to install. And that's because it says your packages are hard linked. And basically what that means is if you install these dependencies, it goes to another folder on your computer here, which is users, Lee, Rob, library, PMPM, and it stores them off here so that when I'm, you know, rerunning MPMI or PMPMI or yarn I, you want to make sure you just reuse that work and you don't redo it. And PMPM is like, hey, by the way, you already installed all of these. So let's make it much, much faster to do that. That's why I like PMPM. Um, but you can use whatever package manager you want. Um, so we have our um, we have our application that's now set up with TypeScript. And let's say I start my my dev server here with PM dev. Another really exciting thing: not only can we see better fast refresh on TS config files, we can also see it for environment variables. So, for example. Let's say that I have this .env.local file and it has my var equals test. Uh, let's say I want to change this and you know make it two instead. Pretty straightforward, but you see that our dev server hot reloads these changes. 
And this works not only for environment variables that are used on the server, which is the default. So by default, these values are not expo exposed to the client side or included in your client side bundle, because you know, this could be uh, you know, some secret API key, right? And you don't want to expose that to your client side application, but inside of your, you know, your index file here, um, let's say that I'll just comment this out. Um, let's say that we want to go and do uh, some div with process dot env dot next underscore public. Now next underscore public is this magic uh, prefix that we can put on environment variables that tells Next.js actually we intentionally want to expose this value to the client side and to the browser. So go ahead and use it basically. So next public my var or var. And if I go over to my application running locally here, um, yep, should see nothing here. And right now, of course, I don't have the correct environment variable name, so it doesn't show up. But if I do next underscore public underscore my var, we see our environment variable hot reloads and it's exposed to the browser because of the next underscore public prefix. So again, small change, small to demo, but a nice quality of life improvement that I think will make all Next.js developers uh, lives easier when iterating locally and working on their applications. So that's, that's improved fast refresh and improved uh, TypeScript auto install. That's, that's basically all that you need to know uh, about those. Uh, now let's talk about the image component. Um, and to do that, I want to show you kind of how it works today versus how it works. Um, well, how it worked before and how it works now is a better way of, of framing it. So first things first, inside of my index route, um, I have an oh, I accidentally imported process. Uh, I have an image component here. I think it's getting squigglies because I deleted my node modules. But <laughs> uh, I have an image component and I'm using it here to take this image gradient from my public folder, have an alt tag for accessibility and then a width and a height. Now, this is a massive image, like 7,000 pixels wide. This is some background that I found on my, on my machine. And if I actually go to localhost 3000 slash uh, gradient and I open up uh, dev tools here, you go to network, um, you see that it's 17 megabytes. Like that's, that's a pretty large image. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's ridiculous. Like who would add a 17 megabyte image? Who would do, who would use a 7,000 pixel wide image? The reality is that when you're working on the web, images make up a, a massive amount of the experience you're building. I mean, just for example, I think one thing that Apple does really well is if you go to apple.com and you look at their, their marketing pages, they have these big, beautiful images. I really, really like it. But you know, loading images uh, correctly is, is tricky to do. I think they, they do a good job here. But as a developer, you can't always control the, the, um, the user that is uploading images into your system. For example, if you're fetching these images from a uh, from a CMS, for example, you might not be the person in charge of ensuring that this image is the right file size. It is a small file size. It's compressed. It's using the latest formats. It's using the right sizes, depending on the browser or the device that the user is visiting on. And if you're just doing a, you know, a normal image tag, that's kind of up for you, the developer, to have to think about all these different permutations. So what the image component does is if we look in our network tab and we filter by images and we do a, a reload here, you, if you remember the image originally was 17 megabytes, right? You see that we have this image request here. It's an underscore next slash image, which is a, a route inside of our Next.js server that's optimizing this image on demand. And we're getting back that it's a WebP file format and that the size is, whoops, the size is 230 bytes. So that's considerably smaller. <laughs> and it is also using a modern image format like WebP that helps reduce that file size over the original JPEG. 
Now, how does it do that? That's because Next.js includes uh, an image optimization server by default, or when you deploy it somewhere like Vercel, we automatically optimize the images in the cloud using Vercel's edge network. So what does this mean? This means that you can upload images that even if they accidentally have a little bit larger file size, Next.js is, and Vercel is going to automatically optimize those images for you to help you get the best file size and the best page loads. Now, having a small file size is only half the battle. For example, if we go look at the underlying DOM elements that are rendered here, you'll notice some, some kind of interesting stuff. So why are there all of these spans uh, that are required to just put an image tag on the screen, you might be wondering. And the answer here is because you want to avoid a web experience where you have images that shift around. This is called cumulative layout shift, and it's a core web vital that you can use to understand the performance of your website. Now, not only is it just understanding the performance, it's also a, a poor user experience to have your page load and to see the images shift around because you didn't define you know, what the width and height are. So what the image component does is it allows you to define the width and height and the previous version of the image component, which is what is aliased to next image right now, use these wrapping div elements or these wrapping span elements to do really two main things. One is to lazy load this image when it enters into the viewport. So for example, um, you know, as I scroll down and I hit images in this post, in this instance, it's these GIFs, right? But as I scroll down and I hit images, you know, for example, there's probably another blog in here that has images too. Um, maybe? <laughs> there's images in, in layouts RFC for sure. Uh, I scroll down, all these images are actually loaded on demand. Let's see if I can get it. Okay. So see, as I scroll, the image URL comes in. And in this instance, um, I actually hadn't even talked about this yet, but you could also optionally allow images to be optimized using the AVIF format, which is even smaller than WebP, but it only works. Uh, it, I don't think it has as good of cross-browser support as uh, WebP does currently today. So images are optimized on demand. And um, you know it, it helps prevent those from having a, a jarring layout shift when they scroll into view, for example. So previously, it required these wrapping elements for lazy loading and maintaining an aspect ratio. We've been working and have now released a stable version of a new image component that takes all of the community's feedback. So thank you for the feedback on what they liked about this image component and what they thought that we could do better with two main goals. One, better developer experience, and two, better performance and end user experience. So how do I do this? I go up to the top of my file and I change to next future image. And this is gonna opt me into this new world. So I hit save and let's take a look at what we have now. We have no wrapping spans. There are no extra DOM elements in the HTML, we just have an image tag. And why is that? Well, the reason is that we were able to actually remove a bunch of code that was necessary to do lazy loading of images uh, in React, basically, because the browsers have now progressed and standardized on a native lazy loading format. So we have this loading equals lazy here in the browser as well as browsers have progressed with cross-browser support for aspect ratio being supported in CSS. So on this image, if I click on here, see this aspect ratio style attribute that we can use instead of having to have a wrapping element that you know does some kind of weird padding calculation to get the image to be maintained right. So luckily, we're able to take advantage of the improvements in the web platform itself to give you a new image component that still gives you all the same value of automatically optimizing images, maintaining your, your width and height, preventing layout shift, lazy loading images when you enter in the viewport. But we're able to do it by shipping less JavaScript and providing a better developer experience for you as you're building your applications. Uh, for example, you might have, you know, you might have wanted to write some CSS that says, hey, let me target this image element. And then you were actually realizing you were targeting the span element instead. 
this will really help without having to have all those extra nested layers of, uh, <laughs> of elements inside of your DOM. And that is the new image component. It's got some other, you know, it's got some other little nice things in here too that you can check out if you're curious. The one that I really like is that the alt tag is now required, which is great because that helps screen readers and voice uh, voiceovers understand how to read out your image. Um, there's a couple other like minor things that are looped into this that you may or may not have needed to take advantage of, but when you're optimizing images, your source image here in this instance, it is a local image in my public folder, which by the way, a, a cool um, a cool optimization here that happens that I, I don't think that I really even mentioned is, for example, if I if I close the dev server, I delete my dot next folder. And then I restart it. So I've, de I've deleted the local assets, you'll see it gets built again. Now, watch how long here it's going to take to optimize this image because it's, you know, it's 7000 pixels wide. It's a 17 megabyte image, right? It's going to take a little bit of time to optimize this image. It looks like it took, uh, it looks like it took four seconds, right? Four seconds. Granted, this is my local development image optimization um, server, which is optimized for um, just lazy versus the prod on demand server, which you could use sharp or you could use uh, a service like Vercel that's going to help that be faster. Still, regardless, 17 megabyte image, 7000 pixels wide, it's not going to optimize in you know 20 milliseconds. The point here is while it took four seconds the first time, what Next.js does is because you have this public folder that has these assets that can be cached in the browser cache using HTTP headers, we're actually able to then when I reload the page, you know, we can actually serve this directly from the cache. We get our 304, we see it's 230 bytes, it takes five milliseconds, right? So this is all automatically handled by Next.js. You didn't need to do anything. It just sets the correct caching headers for you and makes it so that after you've optimized an image, it's cached and subsequent requests to that don't have to re-optimize the image every single time. So a little, little fun tidbit there. Um, if you needed to optimize images from remote locations, so like your source wasn't actually in the public folder, but it was instead in some remote location, you can do that as well too, um, with more specificity over how those domains are, are specified. So I think a good example of this is AWS S3 buckets. Um, if I remember correctly, um, you don't always know the like the full explicit text of what the URL is because there's a dynamic piece of that. But now you can use wildcards, for example, um, say like, you know, I, I, I know that 90% of this URL is the trusted part, but then there's 5% of it or 10% of it that has something dynamic. Um, that's really all I had to talk about about image optimization. If you have uh, questions about the image component or image optimization, please leave them in the chat and I'm happy to, to answer those. Um, really the last couple things here, the one is that I've talked about this previously and you might have already tried this. We've had this um, faster minification, which essentially correlates to faster builds for production inside of Next.js for a while now for, for multiple releases. But just in the last release of 12.3, this is now stable. So if you've been holding off because you weren't sure if you wanted to try it, um, you can now opt in and use this. Um, it's now stable and it will be the default in the next major version. Um, same, by the way, same thing with the image component too. Um, the future image component will be the default in the next major version. So it doesn't hurt to start trying these out today and um, getting used to them. As you saw, all I did was just change the, you know, change the, the import and it just worked. But if you had some kind of custom CSS that was like targeting specific nested elements, then you might need to do a little bit of reworking there as you move that over. Um, the last thing is the layouts and routing update. So uh, a few months ago, we put out this layouts RFC, which talks about uh, basically a, a brand new routing system inside of Next.js that has support for nested layouts, uh, as well as taking advantage of all these React 18 primitives that the team has released. And the best part is that it's 100% incrementally adoptable. Now we added some more details to this. And there's a ton here. I'm just gonna be honest, there's a ton of stuff here. And you might look at it and you're like, wow, do I really need to know all that stuff? And the answer 
is no, you don't, you don't need to know all this stuff. So what I ended up doing that I think would be helpful to digest this a little bit is that I made this post, it's called the Next.js Lance RFC in five minutes. And in my opinion, this is the, the most important stuff that you need to know to take advantage of Layouts RFC. So I'm just gonna walk through this. I, I know there were some, some questions ahead of time from people who wanted to know more about the Layouts RFC and, and what these routing changes are gonna look like. So hopefully this helps clarify some of that. So first and foremost, you know, let's say on the left here, uh, I'm building my, my Next.js application today and I update to the new version when this is fully ready for folks to test out and I wanna start using this stuff. Well, first off, you don't have to. So in the next version, when we release this for, for folks to try, you can continue using the pages folder and continue along with your day and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this out at a, a later point. That's totally fine. It's designed to be incrementally adoptable because we recognize that, you know, some of y'all have very large Next.js applications and you don't necessarily want to have a bunch of breaking changes as you, you know, move over your application. But let's say that you did want to take over just one page or like one route, for example. So maybe you have, um, you know, maybe you have, I'll just copy paste this as an example. Maybe you have uh, an about page here. Let's get rid of this for a second. Maybe you have an about page here. It's in pages slash about and you're like, you know what, this page, we want to move this over to the new routing system. Basically, what you'll be able to do in that new version is you'll say, okay, I want a new folder app. I want to move this about file. Let's just move this over in here. And there's a couple different ways you could go about doing this. You could make a new folder for about, move this inside of here. And the new convention for defining a, a route that is addressable, that you can reference or you can navigate to in your browser is page. So a page file, page tsx or jsx this is now the about page and this would functionally work the same way as if i navigated to localhost 3000 slash uh, about right um the cool thing with the new routing and uh layouts support is that while i can have uh you know a root page in this instance app um htsx this is my index route right while I can have this, I can actually start to make layouts that are shared between different parts of the application. And critically, for those of you who have you know, worked with layouts before in Next.js, it was possible, but it was not very ergonomic. And there was also a loss of React state um, during transitions across those, uh, across those routes. So with this new convention, for example, maybe I have, you know, I have my index page, I have my about routes, we can now create layouts that can be shared across those. So for example, I might say, okay, I wanna create this root layout that both the index page and the about page take advantage of. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna make a new layout and I've got this root layout, it renders a section and it renders some children. So the order of, of execution here is this renders first Right, it renders the section, it takes in some children. This is just React. Uh, it goes to the page, it says, okay, here's the, the route I'm navigating to, which is slash or the, the root index, right? And render this H1 inside of the section. And that's how you end up with some HTML that looks like this. Now, the cool thing is that this layout is shared between all routes in your application because it's at the root. So for example, you know, if I'm on a different page in this blog post, I was doing an example with blogs. Um, but you know, if I'm here and this one is actually about page, uh, what happens is this root layout renders first the section. And then instead of the H1 for hello next.js, it renders here and it renders HTML that kind of looks like this. So it's just, it's much more ergonomic for you to define at the most basic level of like, I have a page and I have a layout. It's just way easier to define and um, uh, explicitly link out the dependencies of this, this route in, in uh, infers this layout or this, this route includes this layout. 
but we can go even further, which is exciting. This is just the, this is just the beginning here. Um, so for example, let's say our about page, we're like, you know what, this root layout is really cool, but on the about page or on the blog page, we want to have a layout that's just specific to this page. We could either, you know, just do a, a layout here um, that is going to have some kind of like side nav. So maybe it's, maybe there's a side nav and there's something here and then the children get rendered here and this is all wrapped inside a, I don't know, it's all wrapped inside a div or something. Like we could have this type of uh, blog layout. And now, not only does this apply to here, I'll just, for, for simplicity, I'll rename this so it makes sense. Not only does this apply to this blog page, this is like your, uh, this is like the index route that has all the different blogs. Not only does this layout apply to there, now if I wanted to do a, uh, a dynamic route, for example, maybe uh, slug, right? Now, if I'm doing something on this, this is an individual blog page. I'm looking at, I'm looking at a specific blog post here, which actually the, the example here in my browser on the right is a, is a pretty good example because I have slash blog and I have slash some slug. So now this slug is what the dynamic route can resolve to and get that information. And the critical thing here is, you know, maybe this is layouts RFC where we pull some information from that slug. Both this root page that says blog page and this layout, as well as the individual page, would all use the same nested layout. So, for example, the rendered HTML would look something like this with, you know, lorem. Like this is this is what your blog post would actually render out. So that's that's pages. There's two conventions here: pages, layouts and how they integrate in with the new routing system. Now, next, what about when you want to grab some data? How do you wanna show that on the screen? How do you want to define your loading and error states? Um, I think one thing that React 18 is really setting the stage well for is using things like suspense boundaries and error boundaries. So actually, I, I don't even need to, to write all this code because I have this nice diagram here for me. But the cool thing about suspense boundaries is it allows you to wrap part of your UI and say this, this part of my interface, maybe it's just a component, is suspending rendering because I'm waiting for some data to resolve. And because of that, I need to think about both the loading and the error states. Now, while you could you know, manually write your suspense boundary or manually write your error boundary, what Next.js is giving you is it's also going to give you two other conventions that allow you to very explicitly define these things if you would like through the file system. So for example, let's say your, your blog here, let's say that you, you know, inside of this post, we were going to be fetching some data from a CMS, from, you know, Sanity or Contentful, and we want to get that information back and render our blog post page. But while we're waiting for this data to be returned, we want to have some kind of loading state or some kind of error state. Now, again, you could manually put a suspense boundary, you could manually put an error boundary, but Nexus says, you know what? We're going to give you this new file loading.tsx. This is going to run on the server. So by default, all of these components here run on the server and they're React server components. So this runs on the server. This isn't a client side loading spinner. And we could do, you know, maybe this is something like this. This is like a loading state. We could have like a fancy loading spinner here. We could do a bunch of stuff, right? But now Next.js's routing system is going to be able to basically intelligently recognize like, okay, while I'm fetching the data for this page, maybe it's a, a dynamic blog post that we want to render on demand. Here's how we can show the loading UI for just part of the page. And this could even get really granular. We could go in further and say, it's actually just the left sidebar that we want to have the loading for. It's just this bottom section at the bottom 
uh, we're able to really map out every piece of our UI into loading in error states to get the furthest level of granularity and also the best performance because we are streaming in this initial loading skeleton from the server to kick things off, followed by resolving the data fetching. Um, so th the same idea with loading where you can you know, render some React component while the suspense boundary is being suspended is the exact same thing is if that data fetch fails and there's some error, we have error.csx, which this is gonna run on the client side. Uh, it's a client component. So error, we'll say like, oh no, you failed. <laughs> and this runs on the client side because it's after your fetch essentially has resolved. Now we haven't, um, the, the React team hasn't decided exactly what this syntax will look like, but it might look something like use client, um, or it might look something like uh, error.client.txx, but there's an explicit way of opting into a client component. Now, this is an important distinction. I, I wanna you know, dive into this a little bit further. I, I see we have some questions here, so I'll make sure we have time to get those. But um, this distinction between server and client components is really important because, you know, let's let's say, whoops, let's say that this is a, you know, use client or client entry or whatever we want to call this thing that denotes that it's a client component. Um, this now functions like any other React component you would write today. So starting today or <laughs> as it works today, all components are, you know, client side components. What that means is you can go in here and you can do, uh, you know, you can do use state, you can do use effect, you can do all the things that you would expect from a client side React component. That is not necessarily true on a React server component. A React server component, you can think about it much more aligned with the web and kind of how you built applications maybe in like 2010. You just fetched some data on the server and you use that data to template or scaffold out some HTML that you returned from the server. So inside of a React server component, you can't use uh, state or effects. Instead, it's mostly how you're handling fetching data, how you're handling actually returning that into some HTML that you send to the browser. Now, why? Why would we do this? Why is it important? Well, the great thing here is that that results in faster page loads because it's less JavaScript that you need to send to the browser. So for example, you know, let's say, let's say inside of this file, like I fetched some data about, uh, I don't know, I, I fetched some data about uh, cat pictures, right? And I, I had these, I had this data here. Now previously, or the way uh, it kind of works today, either with client side react and the way it works today is somebody would have to do a use effect and fetch that data on the client side show a loading state on the client side wait until it resolves and then actually be able to update the html or with next.js you're doing you know like a get server side props you're ooh, can't type ooh. you're doing get server side props you're fetching that data and then you're returning that JSON object to your React component so that you can render some HTML. What does that mean? That means that you didn't necessarily need to send that JSON to the client. Instead, it could just, it wouldn't it be better if it could just all run on the server. And that's what React server components are enabling. So there's some, some exciting developments happening here. Um, we're, we're working on this right now. We're really excited to, to share this with you very soon. Um, I am very excited about it. I think it's gonna change how we build Next.js applications and React applications. Uh, and yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll jump into the Q&A now and start, start answering some questions. So I see one question here. Uh, is there a, uh, a migration tool for new routes and layouts? The answer is going to be yes. Uh, I think at, at the, the minimum, so depending on the, depending on the size and scale of your application, you're gonna have different tolerance levels for how much of the migration you wanna do. For example, maybe you only wanna take over just one route. You know, All you wanna take over is the about route 
And really the migration here is just basically what I was showing where you're, you're moving some files in your file system based routing, like you're moving some over. Um, what, I, uh, what I think the team is hoping to do is have a code mod that you could use to run that would do some of the reshuffling here. For example, you know, the, the pages, it was pages slash about .txs, TSX. And the one-to-one -one equivalent of that is app slash about slash page, right? So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be working on a code mod to help with some of that, helps smooth out that process. But I do wanna emphasize that, you know, we don't expect people to, um, you know, when, when a new version comes out and they're able to, to get, um, take advantage of some of these features, we don't necessarily expect people to go, you know what, pages, boom, rename app folder, like just start from scratch there because uh, it will probably, um, we'll probably be iterating on it and getting feedback from the community on, on, on what y'all think. So it'll definitely be emphasized to be incrementally adoptable and, and, and share your feedback over time. So uh, I, I do see there's another question here about just really the overall motivation for layouts changes and really what the pain point is solving. Uh, I think a, a good way of, of demonstrating that would actually be if I go to the next docs today and I go to layouts, uh, you'll see that, for example, if I want to have this like nav bar and this footer, right? I, I have to basically define it at the underscore app JS level. And this is where I define my layout for my entire application. This is essentially my root layout. The problem here is that one, this is the only place you can define a layout. There's no, there's no granularity more than that. It's just the top level layout. And second, when you're transitioning across routes, you're losing, uh, you, you, can, you can lose some of that state once you start to get into these other permutations, permutations down below. So for example, um, this, this pattern of page.get layout is not great. Uh, it's not very ergonomic and it's not intuitive for developers. We've heard a lot of feedback that they want to be able to use the file system. They want to maintain state across route transitions uh, and they want to take advantage of better loading and error stage through server components. So all of these things have kind of uh, culminated into a, a new router, a new layout system that's uh, really trying to make it easy, easy for folks uh, to, to build complex UIs. Uh, we, we also heard from a lot of people in the community that there was more people than I expected who build dashboard type applications with Next.js. Um, and when you're building a dashboard application, you have a ton of nested layouts and nested routes. And you want to make that, uh, you want to make your code base ergonomic and easy to upgrade over time and easy to work with. And we think that this will help a lot. There's a question here about, you mentioned using Sharp for image optimization. Is that what you recommend for use in production? Does Vercel use that under the hood if I'm deployed to Vercel? So by default, let's pull up the docs here. By default, when you use the image component on your local machine, you're using a library called Squoosh. And it's a web assembly based version that optimizes images. And this is great because it is faster for you to install on your local machine. It's a smaller file size. Uh, and that just helps your, your local development uh, environment get spun up quicker. Now, when you go to production, what you can do, uh, I think we have it in the docs somewhere here. There, there's some part about um, if you want, basically you NPM install Sharp and Next.js will use Sharp in production only when you go to production. Now, and that's during uh, a next build. Now, this is this is helpful, I think, because Sharp on average is probably going to have faster response times for image optimization. If you're putting uh, you know a lot of load on a self-hosted Next.js server that uh, is using image optimization, I'd recommend using Sharp. When you deploy to Vercel, we use Sharp in the build process because it will help you get faster builds but then when you deploy to production we actually have our own image optimization service that is you know underscore vercel slash image basically that's doing all of the image optimization on demand so it's not using sharp or it's not using uh squoosh um can you run the created urls on the browser within the app directory 
I think what you're asking is like, will the, um, will the routes inside of app resolve to the URLs that you use in the browser? And the answer is yes. So if I make uh, app slash about slash page, that resolves in my browser to slash about, right? And the, I guess one thing I didn't really talk about, but a, a cool thing about this is something else that people have asked for is like, what if I wanted to put um, this image inside of the blog folder? Well, previously this was kind of hard to do with the pages folder and you had to like do some workarounds to get it to work because everything inside of pages was a route. Well, in the app folder, it's not necessarily the same thing. Not every file inside of here is a route. The page is a route in the layout is the wrapper around that route, right? So I could go inside blog and I could do, uh, I could do my new component, uh, you know, sentence case here, or not sentence case. What's the case? The capital letter case <laughs> to denote a, a React component, but I could just put a, a good old fashioned component here that is not a, that's not a route. This is not like an addressable route that can render to a URL in the browser. And I can co-locate this with the rest of my code and I can have this here and then use my new component inside of the page and that's fine. So if you don't want to break out your stuff, you could have your entire app inside of app, which is kind of, that's kind of the thought behind the, uh, the app folder naming convention there. So hopefully that answers Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I see a question here. Will layouts maintain state between pages? And the answer is yes, as well as between nested pages. There is another question about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, why are React server components needed when we have Git server side props? What is the advantage of using them? So server components are not a replacement for um, doing data fetching or server rendering on the server. They work in tandem with doing server rendering or data fetching on the server. So server components allow you to shift computation from the client, from the browser, instead to the server and send less JavaScript to the browser. What does that mean? Faster page load times and smaller client side JavaScript bundles. So if you've ever ran uh, a lighthouse report or a performance report, and maybe it said, oh, you've included a lot of JavaScript here. Um, one of the, the things that React is moving towards is less JavaScript on the client, client side and trying to help you do more on the server side where you can run the, an expensive computation, you can include a, a large dependency, maybe a large date formatting library or a large um, time formatting library, but all the server does is just send back the HTML. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, that sounds like very basic. Like that sounds like how people build applications forever. And there's, there's some validity to that. Like it is going back to the roots of how you built an application maybe uh, in the early 2010, because you're just sending content back from the server. But this is where it gets interesting. The difference is then how you add interactivity on top of that. The great thing about server components is that you can interleave both the server component that's like, you know, zero bundle size server components and the client components, which are the React components that you know and love today that allow you to add that rich interactivity into your application. Previously, it was kind of a either or. Uh, it was hard to do both at the same time. Server components helping bridge that gap to give you the ability to do both. Uh, does the new image component work with CDNs? The answer is yes. If you deployed a Vercel today, for example, it just kind of works out of the box. Um, if we use the app directory, can we remove the pages directory? Yes. If you, uh, when we release these changes for, for folks to try out and, and give feedback, um, you can absolutely just move your entire app to the app directory if that's the level of incremental adoption that you want to, want to go. Um, question, what is the best way to make dynamic routes that should only match a predefined list of strings, like type slash dog, type slash cat, type slash turtle, but not type slash wolf. So the way this would work uh, today is you would use git static pass, which allows you to, uh, for example, 
you would define a function, get static pass. Uh, inside, well, actually, I'm in the app folder here, so it's kind of confusing. Maybe what I'll do here is I'll just pull up this image for you. Um, basically, you're telling the Next.js routing system, these are the URLs that you should know about and that you should make aware and make addressable for people to use in the browser. In this instance, post slash one, post slash two, but in your instance, it could be type slash dog, type slash cat. Um, if you wanna exclude a route, it depends on how you wanna handle that. Like if, if the types slash wolf, you want to lock down, there, there's, two, there's two paths, there either it's, the types slash wolf, you don't want anyone to access. It's a secure private route, or you just don't want to generate it. If you just don't want to generate that route, when you're iterating over the paths here, even though the wolf type exists in your database, you could do dot filter and just filter that out and not tell Next.js, hey, don't, don't generate this route, for example, right? The other option is like, oh, this is actually a secure route that we don't want anybody to get access to. What you can do then instead is you can use middleware inside of Next.js or other options, but middleware is probably the easiest um, and, and check an incoming request and say, if the URL request dot or request dot, um, see if there's a good, it, it'd probably be easiest to do matcher, I guess, rather than manually checking the request object, but this is just the web standard request object. You could set up a matcher and say, hey, if it matches slash type slash wolf, actually, we want to redirect to, uh, you know, redirect to some pages that says, hey, hey, you're not supposed to access this, for example. Uh, let's see. Will we have the ability to define the middleware on a per route basis with the new layouts RFC? Yeah, so the question here is um, with middleware, you define a single middleware at the top level or the root of your application. So the same level as your, your pages folder. And this runs by default for every single route in your application. Now you use Matcher to be able to scope down and choose what routes the middleware runs on. Now, when you want different middleware for different parts of your application, uh, a previous iteration we had allowed you to put middleware like directly next to files in the pages folder. But part of the reason we reeled that back is because the app folder was going to change this in a, a pretty big way. Whereas every route inside of the pages folder resolves to a route in the browser, the same is not true for the app folder, as I kind of demoed a little bit earlier. Um, long way of saying we are exploring a way to make this more ergonomic rather than having to be like inside of the middleware saying if this route, then run this middleware. If this route, then run this middleware. It's still possible, you can do it today, but we are, now that we're working to get app out in the world, we will revisit it uh, if there's a, a more ergonomic way of us doing that. Um, question about having multiple apps in the same repo, like a mono repo. Sure, looks that way. Uh, the answer is yes. So the cool thing about app is that your app might actually be multiple apps. You know, like there, there might, that's the really powerful thing about this new routing system. One thing I didn't talk about too much today is route groups, um, which allow you to exclude layouts as well too. So imagine you had six apps, right? And they're all in the same Next.js repository and you have this root layout, but maybe this blog applicate, like th this could be a whole separate app and it could use a route group to say like, hey, we're gonna group these things, my new app. And we can use route groups to say whether we wanna opt out or opt in to specific layouts. So the answer is yes, we've definitely been thinking about this with monorepos in mind. Um, I think that's pretty much all the questions. There's a question here about the, uh, whether we'll have next data in the HTML for server components. Uh, I believe the answer is no. If you're rendering a dynamic like server component, you're computing, um, you know, let's say you're using a date library, for example, you're you're using the date library to render out some HTML and then send it to the, the client. I don't think you would need next data in this world, but I'll wait, I'll wait to see. I don't want to speak too early on that. Um, 
Yes, that's all the questions. And we are just about at time. So that actually worked out really well on time. Um, I see there's the final question here is like, can we try out the app directory today? The answer is we're still working on this. We're making really great progress. Super excited to share something with you very soon, um, but hold out just a little longer and we'll make it so that uh, everyone can can try this out and, and give some feedback. Um, so thank you all for joining today. I, I greatly appreciate everyone joining in. Um, if you have further questions, you can reach me on Twitter or you can send us an email uh, at at Purcell. We have a, a contact form if you want to reach out to us. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Bye.